Did you know that as a Pennsylvanian, you have the rights to clean water, pure air, and a healthy environment? Today, this year, marks the 50th anniversary of Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. We recently had the opportunity to speak with Franklin L. Curry, former Senator of Pennsylvania and author of this amendment. Welcome to Ned Talks. The people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. Pennsylvania was one of the first states to enact an environmental rights amendment, and we as Pennsylvanians are extremely lucky that this amendment helps preserve clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment for future Pennsylvanians. Franklin Curry penned the Environmental Rights Amendment in 1969 as an attempt to guarantee this path of environmental protections for our future generations. Let's talk to Curry a little bit and see what he has to say about it. Hello, uh, I'm Franklin Curry. I'm a retired lawyer and state legislator uh, who was the author of the environmental amendment to the state constitution, a so-called Green Amendment, while I was in the House of Representatives. Pennsylvania's environmental history is not one of consistency. And in fact, many of the policies we have in place today were only enacted pretty recently. Well, the, uh, the idea for the amendment came after I was elected to the House of Representatives in 1966. I ran for the House in 1966 because the then incumbent from the 108th District had voted against bringing the coal companies under the Clean Streams Law. The coal companies had been exempt from the Clean Streams Laws since 1905. So I ran on the issue of a clean politics, clean streams, and I won. And the important thing is, if I hadn't won, none of this would have happened. Prior to European colonization of North America, 90% of the 28.7 million acres that would one day become Pennsylvania was covered in forest. By 1900, 60% of PA's forests were gone. A history of continuous, unsustainable timber harvesting left waterways filled with silt from soil erosion and the landscape barren. It wasn't until the late 1890s that change was instituted on a state level with the appointment of Joseph T. Rothrock as Commissioner of Forestry. Rothrock paved the way to recovery via land surveys and purchases. By the end of his term in 1904, PA had acquired close to half a million acres that would become protected game lands, state parks, and forests. Because I won, I wound up on the House Conservation Committee. In the four years from 68 to 72, our committee processed and approved more environmental legislation than in the entire history of the state. We needed something more permanent than statutes because they can be repealed or amended. And I thought we needed something stronger. And I saw in the New York Times that the New York legislature had approved an amendment to its constitution on state forests. I said, why don't we do something like that? Well, that's how I got the idea and I put it together and I introduced it in, the, in January of 1969. It was not until 1948 after the Donora smog incident, during which thousands of residents of Donora, PA, became ill as a result of breathing in emissions from local metal plants, that Pennsylvanians began to realize both the immediate and long-term effects of air pollution. This event led to the first large-scale investigation of an environmental health disaster in the United States. 
Although the Purity of Waters Act was passed in 1905, limiting the amount of sewage allowed into waterways, it would be almost 70 years later until the Federal Clean Water Act was enacted to strengthen rules on discharge, wetlands, drinking water, and industrial activity. But what really drove it was Pennsylvania's history of being exploited by the coal companies, the railroad companies, and the steel companies. For the century after the Civil War, they really raped the state environmentally. So the people of Pennsylvania really reacted to the amendment very strongly. Uh, the amendment was passed uh, without opposition in either house from either party, although it was amended four times. And when it got to the ballot in May 18, 1971, it was overwhelmingly approved by a four to one margin. Can you imagine that? A million to 250,000. Franklin Curry penned Article 1, Section 27, our Environmental Rights Amendment in 1969, as a pathway to ensure protection of environmental rights for our future generations. Well, the biggest environmental issue by far is climate change. And it's, if you follow the science, the scientists tell us if we don't deal with climate change in the next five, 10 years, we may not be able to, we, we may be sentenced to death here on earth because, we, because of what happens. Now what that means for policymakers and constitutional observers is to reduce the amount of ox the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. And that means we have to transfer out of fossil fuels like oil and coal and into renewables. And I think what's the biggest thing the legislature can do is start let that process we get out of fossil fuels and into non-fossil fuels. That's the biggest single thing they can do. Now this sounds awfully doom and gloom, but that's not why we're here today. There's a reason Franklin Curry saw the need for this change, and we are so happy that he did. As a part of our state constitution, Environmental rights are, occupy a very special place in our governmental framework because like the, they're in the same category as the right to free speech, the right to go to the church of your choice or not to go to church, they have the right to bear arms. All these things are basic rights which are in our state constitution. Now, these rights don't exist in the abstract. They are require the people to understand and support them. So the most important thing our younger people can do, or everybody can do, is talk to legislators, any public official, and ask them how they feel about environmental rights. Because nobody can take office in Pennsylvania without taking an oath to uphold the state constitution. And that means you have to take an oath to uphold Article 1, Section 27. The amendment passed in 1971, and very soon afterwards it would see its first challenge. In the case of Payne versus Kassab, students from Wilkes College attempted to change a street widening project that cut through a public park in Wilkesbury. The challenging students ultimately lost, and the Pennsylvania courts created the Payne test as a result of this, a legal test that for decades to come would trump the environmental rights amendment in any challenge it faced. The pain test had a lot of issues. Most notably, it did not interpret the Environmental Rights Amendment the way it was supposed to be interpreted. The pain test was finally defeated in recent court cases over the past couple years, finally giving the Environmental Rights Amendment the teeth it needed to be effective and it threw out the pain test. These recent cases finally broke a long-standing precedent of not upholding the amendment. An amendment to the United States Constitution like the one to the state constitution, they make, makes it a, a national basic right, like under the Bill of Rights. So that, that, I think, to get that though, is going to take political action. And that means young people have to be not afraid to get in the political arena. They don't have to be candidates, but they sure have to go after the candidates and make them take a stand on this. We've had a lot of backtracking to do, always spending time cleaning up after ourselves, but modern environmental policy looks towards preventing pollution in the first place rather than backtracking. And we are always looking for new advocates. Well, I think I feel very good that I was aware when the, we were going through the environmental revolution 
in the House of Representatives in the late 60s and early 70s. I was, I feel good about the fact that I was politically alert enough to know this was a high tide and we got to sail with it. And if we're ever going to do an amendment, it ought to be done then. I feel good about that. The other thing I feel good about is we drafted the amendment in such broad terms that it can apply to any situation and uh, it isn't tied to coal or oil or anything else or climate change. It's like the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is stated in broad general terms. So I feel very good about all that and I think it's, it's showing that. The biggest thing we can do for future generations is to make sure that the environment is protected for all citizens. Many other states have been looking to adopt different amendments to their bills of rights, just like Pennsylvania. At this time, Pennsylvania, Montana, Rhode Island, and most recently Hawaii have all adopted environmental rights amendments, and nine other states around the country are in the works of creating amendments or getting them passed. Whether we like it or not, we are all connected to the environment, so it's important for us to take care of it. Whether it's for outdoor recreation, the food and fiber industry, or whatever else we rely on the environment for, we need to make sure it's maintained and the premise is all the same. Clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment, they're for all of us. Thanks for watching. Ned Talks are made possible in part through the generosity of the Thelma and Harold Lenker Foundation.